for us, again, just looking at the whole spectrum of uh, uh, last Sunday and moving into this new, brand new week, is that I'm drawn into the scriptures again because I think of the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, for instance, that's a different book in the New Testament, it speaks that in Jesus, God did not simply provide a priest. He did not simply provide a king. He did not simply provide a prophet. Although Jesus is all those three functions, but God, for the first time, he provided a family member. Why? I'm going to say this, this is why. Because he gave us his son because it wasn't simply enough for you to avoid hell. It wasn't simply enough for you to go to heaven. What God wanted from day one is a family. He wanted a relationship with you. And that's why he gave a son, his only begotten son. And this experience of salvation brings you into a family relationship to, if you are like me, when I hear the word family, and especially when I hear my last name, which is, puts us into this family component, my family is broken, brother. I don't know about yours, but, you know, this functionality and craziness and drama, unnecessary pain and suffering, I I'm thinking I'm speaking to the choir. Would you agree? Is that your story? I mean, it's just the way it is. So when it comes to this experience of family coming to know Christ and having a family relationship with God, the bottom line, and here's where we're going for the next few minutes, the bottom line is when you are brought into a family, which in this case is a legal transaction, right? I just spoke of that. It's a legal adoption transaction. Um, it implies that this individual, whoever that is, in this case, maybe you or I come into the family of God, belonging to a family implies a worldview. So when you see a child, a, a teenager, or an adult, whoever they are, how people process life, decision-making, feelings, uh, understanding of, of life, we call that worldview. And the worldview is the, is the coalition, is the coming together of all the experiences and habits and instructions and relationships and everything that happens in life. So translate that into Christianity. Because if I just told you that Friday is the redemption of your sin, and Friday means when I put my trust in Jesus and my sins were forgiven, hell is out of the picture. But that's never enough, right? We have said before, the death of Jesus is never enough. Jesus didn't just die, but he lived. What's my point? Hear me say this closely. If Jesus would have come as a 33-year-old man and showed up just to this world, no virgin birth, no childhood, no adolescence, no none. He just shows up and goes straight to the cross. That's not enough. Because the remission, the, the forgiveness of sins is not enough. You must experience the life of Jesus given to you. So in this case, when it comes to this family relationship with God and you becoming a child of God implies that the worldview, how Jesus thought, how Jesus felt, how Jesus spoke, how Jesus heard things, how Jesus went about life is within you. It's inside of you. It belongs to you. And yet, at the same time, we're growing into that relationship. So, two weeks ago, my wife and I, we were privileged to go to East Texas. That's where our oldest, we have three kids, our oldest lives. And she is over there because of college. She's coming to the end of her college experience. And, and we went to celebrate some things that she was going through and, 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 and just beautiful things. We, and this is the part that I was really looking forward to besides seeing my daughter, obviously. But that Sunday, we were over there in East Texas. We went to worship, to worship service at the church that she goes to. And it was just beautiful for me because that's what I, this is what I do for a living. Um, to walk into a sanctuary where nobody knows you. It was really nice to walk into a sanctuary where I didn't have to think about AC units and, you know, are the classrooms ready? Uh, is the sermon ready? I just went and worshiped Jesus. And that was just refreshing. Now, I'm sitting there, and we're going through the entire service and just receiving the word and, 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 and just experiencing, you know, the, the worship experience. And just somehow, I, I noticed that when the time came, I noticed that my daughter pulled out her um, checkbook, which for a 20-year-old to have a checkbook, really, I'm just like, this girl is old-fashioned. Checkbook. Anyways, so she pulled out a checkbook. She got an envelope. And uh, I want to believe that she does this habitually, okay? I don't know if she was trying to impress me, but she actually wrote out her tithe, put it in the envelope, and gave it. So in my mind, this is what I, this is what just, uh, in my mind, unavoidably, I was translated into 1996. In 1996, 
when I first approached my wife, which wasn't my wife, but I wanted for her to be my wife, um, one of the things that attracted me about this young lady back in the mid-90s was exactly that she was, she grew up in the context of generosity. And, and I don't know about you, if you agree with me on this one, but marriage, when you marry generous people, it's fun. When you marry selfish people, it's hard. And for me, hear me say this. This is not about tithing. This is not about money. But all that I'm saying is this. In life, there are the non-tangibles, such as love and hatred, forgiveness, resentment. You cannot touch those things. Those are non-tangibles. Those are emotions. And then you have the tangibles, right? Such as money. Money is very tangible. Money is no mystery. You know exactly how much you get, and you know exactly where you send it. Simple math. No mystery. I know sometimes you feel like, I don't know where it went. Well, you went where you sent it. That's where it went. Anyways, so here's my point. When you have an individual that on the tangible is generous, in my perception, in the non-tangibles, is going to translate into those things. Does that make sense? I'm using this as an example because, again, just seeing my daughter exercising some of these habits that reflects not only the fact that the Bible commands us to do those things, but it's the fact that I know, because I, I mean, we raised this young lady, is that it's a value. It's something that she does not because she has to, not only because the Bible says so, but it's something because you desire to do those things. So translate that into life as a whole with Jesus. When we come into worship, it's not because the Bible says that we must be in this place, or we come into corporate worship, it's because we get to. It's because of the privilege to be a part of this. So in my mind, again, I'm translating this whole scenario of Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, coming into the first Sunday after Easter. And, and my, my whole deal this morning is to say, okay, besides the fact that I believe, that I embrace, that there is enough historical, anthropological, sociological, in every other venue to prove the resurrection of Jesus... I'm at the place where it's not that I have to believe in Jesus, it's that I get to believe in Jesus. Is anybody following what I'm saying? It's not that I have to be faithful to my wife, but it's that I get to be faithful to my wife. It's not that I have to work at a church, but I get to serve Jesus in a church. Anybody following what I'm saying? So that has to do with worldview. So the Bible is written in a scenario where in this case our series of eight weeks, we're in chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, go to Philippians chapter 2. It's written in a context where the calamities of the writer, his name is Paul, he is incarcerated, he's been persecuted. He's been bullied, and the church is in disarray. Is in disarray organizationally, leadership-wise. There is confusion. There is persecution in the church. The things things are not getting better, and that's what is going to expose. Hear me say this: is going to expose the marriage of what you believe and your worldview. So I'm going to say this one more time. Whoever you are on Friday when Jesus was crucified, whoever you are, whatever you have done was forgiven. On Sunday, what happened is Jesus' worldview was given to you. So when you look at this series and, and the situation in the book of Philippians is that the brokenness of the context is exposing not just Paul's theology or belief system, it's exposing his worldview. Who he is, not just what he does. So in that context, Paul basically says this, therefore, he comes into this conjunction, this grammatical connector between the previous eight verses, which the previous eight verses is nothing else but simply, and if you were with us last week, you might remember this, but the previous eight verses is simply Paul saying this. This is what he said. He said, Jesus in equality with God, Jesus in the same essence with God, did not consider those things to leverage those things for his own benefit. But Jesus' equality with God, Jesus being God, he detaches from those advantages for the sake of the advantage of the destitute, of the lost, of the poor, of the woman, of the children. And, and, and he does those things by becoming a man. And when he walks as a man and he limits himself, which by the way, the limitation is not that he became less than a God, is that he added humanity to his divinity. So as a God, because Jesus is God, he added humanity. So he limits himself, he becomes a man, been in the condition of men, previous verses, been in the condition of men, he now becomes a servant. Been in the condition of a servant, he goes all the place to death, and he dies. Now here's the question from last week. What kind of death did Jesus die? Death on a 
not just a cross, but a Roman cross. What's the point? That not only the one who knew no sin for our sake became sin, but he became a curse. So, so hear me say this closely. On that Friday, Jesus being on that cross, it was the biggest, deepest, and more grotesque expression of sin. That's who he was. That's who he became for you and for me. Is anybody following what I'm saying? Based on that, he comes and says, therefore. So what's the therefore? See, he, he, he may say this. I just have a few minutes left. The point that I'm trying to make to you is coming to Jesus, embracing the resurrection of Jesus Sunday after the Sunday after that Sunday. It implies that this entire verse, verse 9, that I'm about to dissect for you is nothing else but embracing. Hear me say this closely. Please do not miss this. Is having the perspective, the worldview of Jesus in regards to his heavenly father. Why? Because I told you last week that the most important relationship in your life is not your relationship with God. Why? Because your tendency and my tendency, especially when you go through the valley of the shadow of death, especially when you are in persecuted situations, in calamities, when you are going through the deepest of pain, your tendency is to create or to redefine your relationship with God. You say, well, if God existed, fill in the blank. See, that's why when it comes to you coming to Jesus, embracing Friday, embracing Sunday, what, you, what you're doing is you're basically saying, however Jesus related to the Father, that's what it means to be a Christian. That's all that it means. So in moments like this, when you read Paul, what you are really doing, what we are doing this morning, we're simply following the example of Jesus through Paul on how Jesus related to the Father. And whatever Jesus did in moments like Paul, what Paul is going through, whatever issues is going on in life, because Jesus experienced every single thing that we have ever experienced, whatever Jesus did, Paul is basically saying, look at me because I have look at him because Jesus is not simply that I, someone that I met on the road to Damascus, is Jesus' worldview is within me. And now my life, Paul is saying, my life is processed, is dissected, is filtered, is, is journeying through the lenses of who Jesus is. And that's why he says, therefore, what's the therefore? Here's the therefore. The therefore simply implies that it's very difficult to bring it together, the concept of Friday with Sunday. That if he was or he is the suffering servant, and I just explained that to you. That it wasn't simply a, a Jewish man who was put on a Roman cross, but it's the Jewish man that his suffering was a suffering that honored God because God from the beginning, he was a servant. He chose Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the nation to become their servant. If you're here and you are saved, you are saved to become a, say it, to become a, what's the opposite of servant? Is that you serve me. It's entitlement. So there's, there's nothing more, again, more anti-God than for you to declare that you are God. And, and part of what we're trying to tell you is that to bring these two things together is so difficult because our linear thinking, you know, Western civilization, 21st century mindset is like, which one is it? I'm all for being meek and humble and servant, but is that what it means? Or, 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 or does Jesus actually is the Lord who rules over the cosmos. Well, Paul is basically saying, therefore, since this is true, and the answer is yes, the implication is that Jesus, within my limitations of being incarcerated, Paul, incarcerated by a Roman government that seems to be irreplaceable and unchangeable and unbeatable, and seeing my churches that, that I planted, the brothers that I love the most, they're suffering, and my future doesn't look very promising. Here is what I choose to do. That Jesus, in his cosmic lordship, in his sovereignty, he is before, say it, before what? He is before time. That Jesus came always in time. That there is a framework where there was a, a, a young peasant Jewish girl that got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So he came in the right time. And then Jesus, although he's long gone, he is what? He's beyond time. See, that's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to tell you when I'm telling you that part of following Jesus is to embrace his worldview. Because, hear me say this, do not miss this. If you 
if you and I do not hunger the worldview of Jesus, not just the salvation of Jesus, but the worldview of Jesus, you're going to come into verses like this, and this is the tendency you're gonna, you, you and I are going to have. And therefore, God exalted the church, marriage, United States, or myself. See, that's prosperity gospel. That's prosperity gospel. Because Jesus didn't come to exalt you. Let, let me rephrase that. The best way to exalt you and to exalt yourself is by dethroning yourself from self and exalt Jesus. I don't know if that makes any sense. Is my English correct? I don't know. I'm from Mexico, so I get excuses on English. But, but hear me say this. See, the, the, the one thing that you need is not simply a relationship with God. You need the relationship that Jesus had with the Father that has been imputed and given to you. So part of this exaltation is that you lose your ability to argue the point is that, well, I pray. I don't have to go to church. I, you know, you start creating your arguments on how God is supposed to operate in your life. And part of my, for me, is like, my goodness, we, we have this whole thing of the National Day of Prayer coming up. And we'll talk about it in just a minute. First Thursday of every, every May around the year. You know what the problem with those events are? And again, I know it's going to sound critical. I want you to go and pray. But, but hear me say this. Is that the National Day of Prayer cannot be about praying. The National Day of Prayer cannot be about unity among ourselves. The National Day of Prayer cannot be about praying for our government. We should do those things. The National Day of Prayer is about the object of our prayers. Who do we pray to? What does that mean? Hear me say this. Hear me say this. Because I will not apologize if, if the time ever comes. If the time ever comes in the city of Far, that the National Day of Prayer is going to become an ecumenical movement where it involves other religions gathering together for prayer, I just can't do that. Because it, the object is not prayer. The object is who we pray to. So when it comes to Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam, they do not pray to this God that we're preaching about. Does that make sense? I know it sounds very, I, I, know, I know I will never run for mayor. mayor. I understand that. I'll never be president. I understand that. But, but in this case, look at what happens. God exalted Jesus to the highest of place. In the condition of a servant, it was the venue for exaltation. And this exaltation is the exaltation that God, God alone gave Jesus the name that is above every other name. And, and, and again, again, this is so ironic because if, if I am a part of the Philippian church, if I'm looking at Paul basically telling me as a Christian or baby Christian or maybe a pastor in the church in this time, I'm like, okay, brother, so, so what you're saying is you want me to follow your steps because you follow Jesus' steps. And according to this, this is what Jesus is. Here is the problem. The problem is that the name that was given to Jesus through the exaltation at the highest place, the name that is above every other name is the name Lord, Kairos. In the, in the original language. And that name, Lord, is the name that only belonged to the Caesars, to the people in charge of Rome. What's the implication? That anybody that confesses that Caesar is Lord, you get a good, decent life in Rome. But anybody that confesses that anybody else is Kairos, is Lord, then you're ending your life is destined to prison. And eventually, just like the writer of this letter, what happened to Paul? His body is going to be detached from his. He's going to be decapitated. Does anybody want to come to, to the gospel and follow Jesus? It's so hard to understand this, right? Well, here's what he says. Not only your perception of who God is changes, but look at how he also changes you. God is going to change your perspective of who you are because now at the name of Jesus, which is the name is not Jesus. The name is Lord. Not Caesar, but Jesus is Lord. Master. By the way, quick commercial because I love the Old Testament. The word Lord, this word Lord, L-O-R-D, Lord, is, 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 is a translation of the word Yahweh that is given in the Old Testament when Moses is, 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 is having this conversation with the burning bush, and, 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 which is God, obviously, right? And then Moses eventually says, okay, 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 okay I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to deliver you people. I just want to know because they're going to ask me who's sending me. And God replies, tell them that I am who I am. That's the word Lord. That's the word Yahweh. The Jewish people were so reverent of that word and so fearful of God that they switched from Yahweh to the word Adonai. So when the Bible says that Jesus was given 
the name that is above every other name, the perception of who God is is simply that God is deity. Jesus is God himself. Please hear me say this. But the same Jesus is the same name, Adonai, Yahweh, Lord, that is also the covenantal name that embraces humanity. And eventually that name becomes flesh. And Jesus walks into this Lord's Supper, upper room experience and says, in the past, you celebrated with wine and you celebrated with bread. But tonight, you don't get to drink wine. You don't get to see bread. Instead of bread, you're going to see my body given for you. You're going to see not wine, but you're going to see my, come on, say it, my what? My blood given to you. What's the point? That Jesus is the covenant maker. So when the Bible says that he is Lord, it's not that he's just supreme and his name is above every other name. But Jesus taught us from day one that his majesty, his deity, his supremacy is always for the sake of others. And those others are those that eventually, those others eventually will, will eventually will need. And when we knee before God, we're going we're gonna to kneel to do what? In other words, here's where now we can talk about yourself. We talk about God. Now let's talk about you. We talk about who God is, Jesus is. Now let's talk about your marriage and your finances and your dreams and your fears and your past and your present and your future. Who, who is it that we are? We, you and I, who we are, this is who we are. We're simply people who must acknowledge because the Bible says that everyone is going to bow before God. Tracking? Everyone. But the difference between you and I is that our acknowledgement is for the purpose of redemption. That we are in this place and if you have been redeemed, if you have been saved, if you have embraced Friday, forgiveness of sins, but you have also embraced the worldview of Jesus of Sunday and it's been given to you, that implies that your salvation, your salvation, okay, let me, let me put it this way. Jesus did not die for you. Jesus died for y'all. Jesus doesn't love you. Jesus loves the world. He just loves the world through you. Does that make sense? Because since he is deity and he is a, a covenantal God, he is a missionary, your redemption is simply means to an end. Your redemption, your salvation, as much as we enjoy being saved, the reality is that your life is based on the reality that every knee will bow. And, and again, look at the language. It's going to bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. What's the point? That the cosmic lordship of Jesus, Jesus is, it's, not, it's just not before time, but come on, say it. Jesus is in time and Jesus is, what else? It's beyond time. Thank you. Somebody is actually listening. So look at how he closes the whole thing. When you bring the both end of the conversation and you embrace who Jesus said the Father is and who the Father said Jesus is. So here is what God and who God is. And therefore you finally realize who you are. Look at what happens. It happens this way. That is every single individual, every single person will acknowledge once again that Jesus Christ, who is Jesus? His Yahweh, His God. His deity. He's the covenantal name of God. He's supreme. He is Lord. L-O-R-D. And yes, it will cost your very own life to make this confession. So back in the day, watch this, please. This whole concept of baptism, public confession of baptism implies that you are denying Caesar Augustus as Lord, but now Jesus is your Lord. At the expense of potentially your life? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The gospel in the United States, in this beautiful South Texas, in 2019, is the byproduct of blood given throughout history. That's exactly how the gospel came here. We, we have a tendency to romanticize that if we can just have immediate access to tons of information via the internet, which I want you to acknowledge these things, but, but guys, hear me say this, because he, here's what I want you to really challenge yourself on this regard. Jewish people thought and always believed, and this is one of the reasons why they crucified God, Jesus. It's because they always believed that when Messiah showed up, Messiah came, he was going to literally divide and split the world, time, into two sections. It was going to be the section or the area of evil and brokenness and bullying and the dominion of foreign countries. But then when, when he came, 
but as he comes, he's going to get away with this and now bring the era or the times of righteousness and refreshing and justice and goodness. The problem with Jesus, here's what Jesus messes things up, is that Jesus did not do this. Oh, Jesus came and Messiah came. You know what Jesus did? He overlapped them. Why? Because Jesus made the mistake, and I'm speaking obviously facetiously on this. He made the mistake not to come through Mary as the Lion of Judah, but he came as the Lamb of God who comes to do what? To forgive sins. Now, here's the problem. If you're a Jew, you're like, all right, bro, I'm all for forgiveness. But then Jesus is a kind of a guy that has this crazy idea, not just to forgive sins, but he forgives sins of the Gentiles. He forgives sins of the people that for some crazy reason, Jesus goes into a well and a Samaritan lady comes into the picture and says, can you give me water? And then the conversation engages. Remember the story of Samaritan woman? So I'm just like, see, Jesus, you disqualify yourself from messianship. Well, here's the bottom line. This whole component of the acknowledgement of who God is is a futuristic second coming. Because, yeah, this is where we are today. Not, not here. This is where we are. So Jesus has begun his kingdom. Jesus is Lord of lords. Yet we are in a time where there is the prince of the air. His name is Satan. And he rules with power temporarily. Tracking? So here's my point. The acknowledgments is a futuristic thing. But the acknowledgments is that Jesus Christ is, is Lord. So my invitation today, because today is the day where you can have the Lordship of Jesus over you for the forgiveness of sins. If you were to deny, reject, ignore this Lordship and acknowledge it today, and you wait until tomorrow, until tonight, until next year, and Jesus were to come back, and instead of doing this, watch this please, Jesus is going to do this. And this is gone. Your opportunity will be gone because now he's not coming as the Lamb of God to forgive sins. He's coming to do what? He's coming to give people what they deserve. And if you have not come into the acknowledgments and Jesus' worldview is not your worldview, you will not belong to Jesus. How do I know this? Because look what he says. He says, everybody that embraces the worldview of Jesus today is the person that embraces the worldview of this Lord, of this Jesus, because Jesus came to the world to bring glory to the Father. So the reason why you are in this place is not to glorify God, but is to glorify God the way he glorified God. Because that's his world view. So this morning, my invitation as we pray, and we're about to play, can we get the lights, guys, please? Is simply understanding this, that the glory of God, when you confront, when you embrace the worldview of Jesus and the glory of God is displayed, it displays his holiness. And what the holiness of God always does, it exposes your and my prosperity gospel says this, Find the holiness so you can shine and be prosperous and better and just improve your relationship and get this illness out of the way. No, 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 no. Can God do those things? Yes, he can. But the first thing that the presence, the holiness, the, the majesty of God, the glory of God does, it exposes your brokenness, my sinfulness. And I'm saying sinfulness because it's not a very common word. Because today people call it mistakes. People call it, it's a season, it's a phase. It was just the scenario. It's just where I came from and how I grew up. No, it exposes the sinfulness of man. That today, the win is that you worship in a lifestyle. And look at the age, it's capital H. So whose lifestyle you are supposed to, I'm supposed to embrace. I'm all for you to worship. And by the way, worship is unavoidable. You will worship. You are worshiping someone or something. My invitation is that we worship under the lifestyle of Jesus Christ.